Well, as NVIDIA continues to drive the market rally, companies are looking to hop on the AI train by reallocating capital to AI spend. Not all of it is created equal. Yahoo Finance spoke with Alex Karp, he is Palantir CEO, about the challenges facing executives regarding AI expenditures. Here's what he had to say. I think what everybody watching this is familiar with is you have a massive hype cycle around large language models. And then when you try to use them in your enterprise, you find out that it's more like self-flagellation and it's expensive with no output. So how can investors evaluate AI expenditure and not go into the self-flagellation quote that Alex Karp just talked about? For, for more on this, we've got Luke Bars. He is Global Head of Client Portfolio Management for Fundamental Equity at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Luke, great to have you on here. I know you just heard that soundbite, but from your perspective, what is the correct framework that investors should be utilizing to suss out AI CapEx and what is you know, really going to lead to growth on the R&D side versus just something buzzy to say on an earnings call? Yeah, so firstly, Shauna, thank you so much for having me. I, I would say first and foremost, we need to reflect on the fact that AI is transformational. It is changing how we operate and it is rapidly changing the dynamics in some of the technology hardware businesses that we assess and value as, as investors. Now, what I would say is just thinking through the timing and the sequencing of that, we're at a point now where your hyperscalers are investing every incremental dollar they can find in staying ahead of the pack as much as they possibly can on the LLM development side. And that means that if you're a semiconductor business that's aligned to server and hyperscaler capacity extension, you're in a very sweet spot at this point in time. Now, I think as we go forwards, we should expect competition. We should see some change in dynamic in that industry as we see more companies come to market with capabilities in that space and or as we see the shift from the best in class, leading edge nano capacity semiconductors towards something a little bit more cost effective in the ASIC space, actually changing that a little bit. But right now, we're still very bullish on the space. We have to be thoughtful around valuations, but we see a lot of opportunity. Luke, when it comes to, uh, you were recently ha had the opportunity joining a small group of investors invited for the day to spend some time uh, with Microsoft's senior management team. I'm curious what your takeaway from those conversations are just in terms of where we are in this AI cycle and, and how much opportunity it sounds like still lies ahead. Yeah, and actually just interestingly, our leading investment team on the global and US side have just spent the week on the West Coast meeting with roughly 20 companies, both public, private, and actually also on the VC side. So I think we've got some real time intel into what's happening in that space. And I think the very short answer is we're still at the very early stages of this transformation, especially in the public market context. We're still at the cutting edge of how can you utilize LLM and big data analytical tools in that AI framework? And then how can you apply that into real world solutions? And so I think at the moment, we're seeing a clear cycle of accelerated earnings in the enabling technologies, we're not seeing the evidence of that passing through into the software businesses in the way that we would expect to over the medium to long term. And so as we see the long term adoption of AI techniques within those productivity enhancing solutions, I think that's a further bull case for some of those software businesses, especially the bigger names that we know are at the front edge of that development. Yeah, earlier we were looking at a stat showing that over the last 11 weeks, 60% of the sell-off in tech stocks was coming specifically out of software stocks, Luke, which is no small amount. What is the framework for thinking about how to time a potential bottom for software stocks? Is there room for recovery in that area this year for investors? Well, taking one step back, first and foremost, the, the way we're investing is bottom-up, long-term, fundamentally focused. And so... I think it's always going to be challenging to say I can find the exact bottom in some of these names. What we need to do is differentiate between those that have leading capabilities, market leading positioning, and are adopting these new gen, NI tech, gen AI techniques into their solution to enhance the offering. And actually, if you can find those at a level today that looks compelling over a five plus year basis, that's a very interesting entry point. So actually, if you look at the portfolios we're managing, we're adding exposure in some of those where we see the best in class software solution capabilities. Luke, when it comes to some of the trends, I saw shifting gears here just a bit, because also one of your big takeaways, it looks like from this note from earnings season, was what we learned about the consumer. And to me, it was a bit of a mixed picture, just in terms of, it almost seemed to vary company by company. I'm curious, what were some of the trends that you noticed here over the last several months? Well, I think the simple conclusion is we're seeing bifurcation in the consumer. Uh, and it actually also parallels a little bit to that recent trend on the software side, where we are seeing weakness in the lower end consumer. We are seeing that trade down effect. I think 
Mark Clues you had on from Campbell's Soup previously very clearly articulated, you are seeing people think about value and how they're spending. And so as that cost of living issue has started to impact them more significantly, you are seeing that feed through into how they're trading in the consumer side of things. Now, the luxury space is still doing very, very well. And you're seeing significant momentum in some of that luxury part of the universe that actually doesn't look like it's cooling off too substantially. On the software side, I think the parallel there, just to come back to that for a second, is that is really weakness in the SME space. And so as we think about the forward look for, for markets and we think about the opportunity we have from this point forwards, the economy in the US looks okay. We've just seen latest payroll numbers. They look very compelling, but obviously it's just put the Fed on a little bit of a pause potentially. That to us is a very interesting entry point into a long-term growth story in the US because the economy still looks fairly robust as long as you can differentiate away from some of those businesses that are facing the pressures of that consumer spending challenge. And taking a step back, and you mentioned kind of the macro impact of all of this, and you you talk about the large number of rollbacks from a company like McDonald's. You're just talking about Campbell's Soup, but you also talk about a company like Delta having the higher end revenue outpacing the main cabin. It makes me think about a K-shaped recovery, and I wonder to what extent we need to be worried about when that becomes the next shoe to drop for the economy, or as long as some spending is fueling growth, does it matter if it's a K-shaped recovery? I think it's important in terms of thinking about how you're investing in the US equity market at this point, because there are going to be significant winners and losers. You're going to have businesses that are, for example, going back to our discussion around AI, at the right side of that AI investment cycle. And if we're seeing roughly a trillion dollars of investment in CapEx in the S&P 500, and 800 billion of that is coming from your hyperscaler businesses, you need to be well aligned to that to succeed over the near term. But I think looking at it more medium to long term, we know the Fed has capacity to cut rates. I think you had my colleague Greg Torto on talking about small caps yesterday. We think there's a lot of opportunity in the small cap space. It's hard to say definitively when does that inflection point come, but the starting point valuation-wise is compelling. The economy looks okay, not perfect, but if the Fed has the ability to support that should you see a worsening in economic profile, I think that's a very interesting place to be starting that investment cycle. I want to end with this new DOJ probe into Microsoft and NVIDIA. Now, typically the Eurozone is ahead of U.S. regulators when it comes to policy surrounding tech giants, social media, now looking into AI. How should investors be thinking about playing the regulatory moves coming from the U.S.? And does it present more opportunity in the Eurozone? I think first and foremost, we have to be very cautious as it relates to regulation just holistically, whenever you've got dominance in individual industries. But at the same time, let's recognize that these are businesses that are driving an enhancement in the solution they're able to deliver, which is productivity enhancing and so deflationary in many ways. And so I think there will always be a weighting against, okay, the dominance of certain businesses with what it delivers to SMEs and what it delivers to individuals. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily strong differentiation between US and Europe. I think we have to be sensitive to that in both jurisdictions uh, and actually just be very thoughtful in terms of the individual businesses you're buying and their exposure to those potential risks. All right, Luke Bars, it was great to have you. We hope to have you back again soon. Goldman Sachs Asset Management, Global Head of Client Portfolio Management for Fundamental Equity. Thanks so much, Luke. Thanks for having me.